Well, good morning and welcome again. My name's Dave. I'm, I'm one of the, the pastors here, and we are in for just an incredible morning. So if you're new, we're so glad that you are, are with us. If you've been a part of the church for a long time, you're going to love it as we change things up a little bit this morning and do something a little bit more unique. With us this morning, we have Brent Jones. He's played 11 seasons for the 49ers, which to give you some perspective, the average career is 3.3 years in the NFL. Brent has three Super Bowl rings. The Niners only have five Super Bowls, so he's got three. The team with the most Super Bowl rings is six. He's got three of them, all right? Uh, Brent is a three-time All-Pro. He's four times Pro Bowler. He is the best in his position. Ladies and gentlemen, would you give a round of applause for Brent Jones? All right, welcome, brother. Thanks, Dave. You know, Brent and I know each other a little bit from the Bay Area. We went to the same church for a number of years. And uh, Brent, you actually have some family that lives somewhere nearby here? I do. My, my parents actually retired in El Dorado Hills. After all those years of coming up I to Rockland and, and training camp, they would drive around between practices, discovered this uh, pasture that we call Granite Bay nowadays. And uh, they initially built their house there. And then uh, about 15 years ago, they moved up to El Dorado Hills. So they love the area. It feels like it's my home away from home up here. I love it. Well, we've, we'll adopt you. You're in. Uh, here's what I love about Brent. He's, he's the real deal. And I should have said this before he came out here so he doesn't have to blush. But, you know, just in last service, we were actually... Uh, we had met a guy in our church through a new attenders lunch. His parents lost their home in the fires. And so uh, he's a huge 49ers fan, we found out, just this week in our church. And he lost all of his memorabilia, and he had quite the collection. And so uh, last service, we started rebuilding that collection, and uh, Brent was able to give him a football. And then I love afterwards in service, Brent's like, give me your address. I want to really stoke your, your memorabilia collection. And so just that's the kind of guy that Brent is that we have with us this morning. Uh, Brent, we, uh, this morning is unique for us. We don't always interview people for, for our sermons, but the reason, church, that we're doing this is, is twofold. One is we never want to become a church that grows disconnected from culture. We want to be a church that's what we talk about in here, what we apply in here, goes with us out there, right? And so things like our everyday life, our families, our sports, our careers, all of it matters in here. And so we know that many of you race out of here, because I see you, to make it home for football on Sundays. And so we know that football is, is, is one of those symbols. It's part of our DNA. It's part of our culture. We love it. And so we thought, let's, let's bring that conversation into the sanctuary. Let's bring it into what God's doing here. And then two is we believe stories matter. And so each week you do see us sharing people's stories and their testimonies of what God's doing in their life and who they are and some of the fun stories behind them. And so this morning is a chance for us to dive into your story and uh, what God's been doing and how he's been able to use you. So with that said, man, would you help us just jump in? Not everybody knows your story. Would you help share some of your story? Sure, Dave. Um, so Bay Area kid, born and raised, uh, grew up in Almond Valley in, in San Jose. And uh, yeah, give it up. It's a good shout out right there. <laughs> That's a good shout out. It, it is. Actually, uh, a few guys, uh, last service, high school football buddies that, play, that I hadn't seen. And that, it was pretty uh, we, awesome. We walk into a volunteer yeah. huddle, and he was just going to pray with them, and uh, a guy from his football team in high school is like, hey, what's up, man? Isn't that amazing? It's pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. Hey, he looks skinny. Me, not so much. <laughs> um, but it grew up, and, you know, when I grew up, and, and some of the older folks uh, like myself can appreciate this, you played the sport of the season that it was. You didn't you specialize in lacrosse or soccer or football. You didn't do travel anything. You traveled down to the local school, to the, you know, to the field. That's where you traveled to. And so uh, um, grew up playing all sports, and really baseball was my thing. And so by the time I got to high school, my dream was to become a professional baseball player. And I thought I was pretty good and Love football. Went out for football my sophomore year. Broke my wrist in the second game. So I was out for the season. Um, wanted to keep playing football my second year. Went out uh, my junior year and had a real bad back issue and, and actually had to do some, see a few doctors and do some things during training camp. Uh, it got messed up. And so I wasn't able to play my junior year. And then my senior year rolled around. I've been playing baseball and, and football's hard. Football is not an easy thing. And so I was on the fence, man, nah, maybe I'm going to play, maybe I don't want to, and, and all my buddies were playing, so I went out for football. Now, I thought I was pretty good, but I think I might have been the only one that thought I was any good. 
I, of course, my mom and dad probably thought I was good. Um, but I worked so hard, and I was our second string wide receiver. And my buddies on the team used to come up to me and say, yeah, you're getting ripped off. You should be playing, this, that, and the other thing. I'm like, yeah, that's great. I, I just got to keep working harder. I just got to keep grinding through this. I was second string my whole high school career. Uh, we had a guy get hurt, and so I played a little bit in my last couple games, played a handful of, of games. I think I had my, my stats from my senior year, I think I had six or seven catches. That'll, that'll get you uh, real far. And so that, I kind of just shrugged my shoulders and like, okay, cool. And I played football and hung out with my buddies. It was a great bonding experience. We had a lot of fun, a lot of closeness on our team. Played baseball, was, was planning on getting a scholarship to college in baseball. And I had a few offers. A few weren't exactly what I wanted. A few schools, maybe not. And so it's the summer now. I just graduated. And out of the blue... The 1st of July, the University of Santa Clara called and offered me a partial baseball scholarship, partial football scholarship. Now, you don't know how ridiculous that sounds for a guy that didn't really play. And so I thought to myself, all right, at least somebody thinks I'm good. Um, but I, I ended up accepting that. Our high school coach, who who didn't think enough of my skills at the time to start me, talked to the coaches in Santa Clara and said, hey, this guy's really got some potential, and he works hard, and he could, he could be a guy that could you know, really help you out. And so I went to college. Now, this is July 1st. I decided to accept that and went to Santa Clara as a two-sport athlete. Now, I had been playing baseball, looking at my schools. I thought I was going to go to USC down in, in Southern California to, to play baseball. That was really my goal. And then at the time, I thought, oh, maybe I'll just go to junior college for a year, maybe get into the major league draft if I have a good season. And now I find myself at Santa Clara, which I really had never thought of. And, and worse than that, I had done nothing uh, to get in shape, to lift weights, to be physically fit. And so I had two weeks to get ready for training camp and showed up. And I was an 18-year-old kid that wasn't even shaving yet. I mean, I was just, I was still growing. I was like, all right, all right, Santa Clara football. And I arrived on campus, and there were some serious men, old men, beards, mustaches, crazy old-looking guys. Um, some guys, I, I, I swear, they, they could have been housed down the road at Folsom Prison. Um, and I thought to myself, how did I get here? What's going on? I mean, I'm, I'm just a wide receiver. I'm, I mean, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't start um, and didn't really play. And so I tried to fit in and run around. And, I mean, it was brutal. Training camp was brutal for three or four weeks, double days, and big, tough, mean grown men slamming you, hitting you. But we had a guy that was the biggest, the toughest, the meanest, the oldest looking, and he was our captain. He was a middle linebacker, and I have to say, everybody was afraid of him. Nobody gave him any lip. He, he kind of ran the team, and I was so relieved. And it's funny to say relieved because... I knew who he was because he went to my high school, Leland High School. He was four years ahead of me. I'm like, oh, this guy will take care of me. He'll, he'll be the big brother. He'll look out for me. No. <laughs> he terrorized me the first three or four weeks I was on campus. Hit me hard in practice. Uh, you know, rookie night. There were no rules about hazing back then. Haze it, do this, got to do that. Pour, you know, tobacco juice on your head. Um, it, uh, if I sat and talked about the, the things we have to go through, it would be a 30 minute story. Needless to say, this big, tough, mean leader uh, of our uh, football team that went to my high school after about three or four weeks kind of started softening. He, he figured out I, I was a gamer. I at least worked hard. I was, I was tough. Um, and he's actually the reason I'm sitting here. Um, he, he goes to church here. Dave, Dave, where are you? Stand up. You here? I love it. Well, hey, he did bring you. Is he you standing up? Where is he? Dave. And he bought no, you No, I said stand morning. up. Oh, you are standing up. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. Hey, it never gets old, pal. That's what you get for all those years of picking on me, putting shaving cream in my bed and my pillow. I mean, I was, I was this far to quitting and going home to my mommy and daddy. And that's right. It's payback. He did get you Starbucks this morning. He though. did get me Starbucks. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. he's he's uh, one of my one of my best friends and just a dear guy, a great heart. And uh, but he was mean and tough. Nobody messed with him. He uh, I thought we had the high school thing going. He eventually kind of started taking care of me, but it was too late. I was already terrorized. <laughs> I love it. Hey, what was your journey? Okay, from that point then into the draft to the 49ers. So yeah, you know. We're talking about a, a second-string guy that showed up that got terrorized and was around a bunch of men, and, and now you're talking draft. But um, the story's kind of a, a wild one. It's a wild ride. Um, so I was at Santa Clara. Um, I redshirted my first year. My second year at Santa Clara was the first time that I got to go on the field and start. I was a wide receiver, and I was so happy. I was, I'd been practicing for like three years and never gotten a game. And I'm like, wow, this is actually fun when you get to play. Um, and so... I, I, I had a, a good football season, came out. Uh, my second year of baseball, I was, I was getting ready to go. Our last game of the year, my sophomore year, uh, I got hit, dislocated my shoulder really bad and had to have surgery. And my baseball coach was upset that I was playing football, was going to miss the baseball season, and he took my baseball scholarship away. He gave it to somebody else, and I was devastated. I was angry. I was frustrated. I was transferring. I was on the phone. I was calling junior college coaches. I'm out of here. Forget this. You know, these guys said this. You know, my dream was to play pro baseball. And I, I don't even know how I was at Santa Clara University at the time, and I was playing football, and that messed up my baseball career. Needless to say, I was gone. And I went in, and I talked to our head football coach, uh, a legendary guy by the name of Pat Mallon. He said, hey, Brent, we're going to pick up your baseball scholarship. I hate that that happened to you, but we love you here in the football program. We think you can be a heck of a player for us. And one other thing, we're going to change your position from wide receiver to tight end. We think you can be a tight end. And we think if you work hard, there's a chance um, that maybe someday you'll get a shot in the NFL. I was like, wow, that sounds pretty cool. And, of course, I've played one year now of Division II football, and they're talking about the NFL, and and that was such a a ridiculous statement and dream for a guy that really hadn't put forth the time and effort in the sport. Um, But it really, it changed my trajectory. I started working hard. I started lifting weights. I started running. I put myself on a, a speed program. I was intent on giving it a shot. So I stayed at Santa Clara University. I didn't transfer and waved goodbye to my dreams of, of ever playing baseball again. And I, all of a sudden, I decided, okay, I guess I'm a football player. And um, a few years later, I was fortunate enough to uh, make a few All-America teams and go to the Combine back then. Uh, it was like, to tell you how old I am, I think it was like the second or third year of the Combine. Everybody talks about it now, where the top 300 players from around the country come and I, I can still remember guys teasing me like Santa Clara is that like a high school and I'm like yeah yeah I've heard that before um, and so I ended up getting drafted in the NFL draft by the by the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, in the 1986 draft yeah that's like a plot twist I love that and we'll talk more about that yeah you can clap it's a pretty incredible journey before we go further, um, hey, tell us, when did God start playing a role in your story? Was it before or after? How'd that work? So, Dave, um, my sophomore year in high school, we went to high school 10th, 11th, and 12th. And so when I first got to Leland High School, uh, a couple friends of mine were going to this thing called Young Life. And a lot of the older guys on the football team were going and, and some of the cool kids. And so I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll go. That's That sounds great. It's better than doing homework. And so... Um, Go out, we'd have our, our clubs on a, a Monday night, and there'd be 120 kids there, and it'd be fun. It'd be, it'd be singing songs and doing skits and laughing and, and just kind of getting to know other kids in the school. And that was a blast. And then the last 10 or 15 minutes, they'd talk about God and his son, Jesus Christ, and they'd talk about the gospel. And I figured, huh, okay, that's just the price you have to pay for, you know, 45 minutes of fun. And so you have to sit around and listen to the spiel at the end. 
And so it's funny because as the year went on, I felt like a lot of those things that they were talking about were applying to me. And I wasn't as focused on the first 45 minutes toward the end of the year. I want to hear what they say the last 15 minutes. And so uh, I became a Christian May of, of my sophomore year at, at Leland High School. And, and that decision really changed the trajectory of my life. I knew that God had a plan for me, that he loved me. And I certainly didn't think it would take me through the NFL, but it gave me that internal peace and just, hey, God's in charge. And I, I worked hard, uh, did the best I could, and just said, all right, I'm yours, God. Where, where am I going? I love that. Hey, now, where does your wife come into the picture, uh, and how long have you guys been married for? <laughs> so I, uh, I did skip over the, the part about my wife. I'm glad she's not here. I'm yeah. in trouble. So when I made we'll, that we'll decision, keep this offline, no, this right? is, actually, it's a little reverse. Uh, we talked about it earlier. Um, so when I was going to leave Santa Clara, I was in 10. I was, I was angry. I was mad. I was a baseball player, and I was hot under the collar. Um, and just being a Christian doesn't mean you don't face adversity. They're not struggles. Uh, things don't go right all the time. Um, whether it's in your job, whether it's in your, your school or your, you know, your opportunities. And so I was upset, and I felt like, hey, it was, it was time to leave Santa Clara. Um, I prayed about it a lot, and, and there was something that was holding me there. And when I talked to my head football coach, and he said, hey, we're, we're going to pick up your scholarship. We love you. It's going to be important for you to stay here, get a great education, um, and, and we're going to move your position. Um, I thought, you know what? There's something is drawing money here, you know, through a, a lot of prayer. And so I decided not to leave. And, and two months later, uh, my future bride walked onto campus, which was, which is pretty cool. Um, and that's when I met her. And so forget about the football stuff. I mean, that's, that's the most important reason to stay at Santa Clara. And, and how many years? Make sure married? that's on tape. So yeah, she make hears sure it. that's on tape. That's good. And how many years now married? We've been married 31 years. I love that. I love that. What a, uh, 11 seasons in the NFL, what's been the trick to having a great marriage? So uh, it's funny. Uh, it's, it's, it's really not that simple when you talk. It, or it's not that simple. It's not that hard when you talk about it, but in practice it is. But we always put our faith first, and that was really the stabilizing force in our marriage and in the, in the National Football League because pro sports, it's thrown at you a 1,000 miles an hour. It, you name it, the money, the fame, the, the cars, the girls, the you name it, the the drugs, it's it's all real and it's all there. And thank God I had that grounding going into it because most guys don't. And you see it a lot. You see a lot of crashing and burning in the locker room. And you see it post-career. Um, I mentioned last session, I think the, the divorce rate for, for the NFL is I think it's 82%. I think for guys at the Pro Bowl level that, that have made more money, that have had more success, I think it's 92%. And you're a four-time Pro Bowler. Yeah. Unbelievable. I'm part of the, the happy 8%. I love that. Yeah. Man, a round of applause. All right. Well, hey, so tell us about um, – well, let's, let's do some rapid round questions before we keep going on. Is that rapid round? Is that okay with you all? All right. All right. Uh, baseball or basketball? Oh, baseball, even right. though it's boring as heck. <laughs> to watch uh, Mac or PC I was an early Mac guy I was on the bandwagon Love it. so good one of my good victories Starbucks or Pete's it's Starbucks all the way mm. Pete's is, is too strong for me <laughs> <laughs> I got like an amen down here this is great yeah. uh, kiss on first date uh, yes with my wife no with my daughters there we go <laughs> truck or Prius I live in Texas I don't even think I know what a Prius is. <laughs> You'd like delete that word. Never from your even, I don't think I've seen a Prius. Yeah, they don't exist in no. Texas, huh? Uh, one word to describe a typical huddle. Ooh, uh, I would say respect, because somebody has to command that huddle, and for us, it was either Joe or Steve. Um, and believe it or not, we're all human. At least once or twice a game, one of the linemen would come back complaining that they weren't holding or they'd be in a fight with some guy. Or they, and, and, and Joe and Steve would tell them to shut up and, uh, so we can call the play. And, and a lot of times you're on the road. Half your games are on the road, and the fans are screaming, and you can barely hear anyway. And so you've got to 
have reverence for the play caller, respect to get the play in. Because if if you can't hear and you, you're going up the line of scrimmage and there's been a, a time or two where I didn't get the play and you're thinking to yourself, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? Um, so you really wanted to show reverence there. In fact, uh, good stories. Every now and then, Jerry would come back to the huddle, and Jerry was great, but he would, he'd be frustrated, and he'd tell Joe that he's open or something like that. And that doesn't sound like a big deal, but the way that Joe would hear that would be, Joe, you suck. You're not seeing the fact that I'm open. So if Jerry – he didn't do it very often because if, if Jerry ever said anything to Joe – Joe would grab me on the sideline and said, BJ, Jerry's complaining too much. Be ready. That means he, I'm going to throw it to you the next three or four times, no matter what, <laughs> to teach Jerry a lesson. Now, Steve would never do that. If Jerry said to Steve, I'm open, Steve would throw him the ball no matter what because he wanted to keep Jerry happy. Um, and so it's kind of funny, the, the nuance there. Now, don't tell those guys I said that because I'll be in trouble. <laughs> I love it. Okay, uh, would you share a room with Jerry Rice or Joe Montana? I'd share a room with, you know, both those guys would be great. Um, Jerry would be a little wired. He's kind of high energy all the time. He'd be bouncing around the room, probably making me nervous. Joe would be chilling. We'd be watching TV, watching a game or so. Probably Joe. I roomed with Steve for 11 years, so I'd clearly take both of those guys over that sucker. <laughs> we'll send him that clip. That's great. Yeah. That uh, be good. You know, here's the deal. What I love about getting to talk to you in the weeks to, that led up to this moment is, and we learn this from athletes on maybe a more visible level, but the adversity that you guys do walk through, and the th I, you know, everything comes crashing down when you break a bone, right? Everything you've you've placed all your your your, your weight on, uh, and the same is true for all of our lives, right? We've all got adversity that we walk through, things that you you expect that this is going to be perfect, my family's going to be great, and then something hits and its family dynamics are off, or I've got this career we move for, and then the, something happens to your job, and and so we all in this room are walking through ad adversity, and uh, and you had to walk through that, especially early on. You had just finally, after playing second string on, in, in college, you finally got drafted. Uh, what happened? So it, it does kind of help complete the story because you're like, hey, this guy played for the 49ers. He got drafted by the Steelers. Two weeks after I got that call uh, from Art Rooney of the Pittsburgh Steelers saying I'm their tight end of the future, and this was a legendary organization. Uh, I was so excited. Went back to Pittsburgh, came home, and a few days later, a drunk driver came down the wrong side of the road and hit me and my wife. And the uh, accident was pretty bad. Uh, she, broke her, uh, her, she broke her jaw, dislocated her shoulder. I had a herniated disc in my neck. And, you know, we were at the hospital. It was an ambulance. It was one of those things. And thank God we were okay. We were wearing our seatbelts. But playing professional football with a herniated disc in your neck is probably not a good injury. And so I went back to Pittsburgh and was on the injured reserve list. And, and people look at you sideways when you're, you know, on an injured list, no matter how, how, how great they, they think you are. And so you're not really participating. So I went through a couple months back in Pittsburgh. And about a month into the season, uh, the Steelers decided that they didn't think my, my, the disc herniation in my neck was going to get any better. And they were going to get rid of me. And so I came home. Uh, the end of September in 1986, so defeated, so frustrated, so um, a little angry at God. Like, God, how could you take a guy that has no business being in the NFL, prop him all the way up, get him drafted, send him to Pittsburgh, and then car accident, injured? Um, and I think it, it's really a, a good uh, story about what happens to us in life. Sometimes some of the greatest opportunities are just around the corner and and we go through stuff and we're we're sad and we're frustrated and there's adversity and it's adversity and it's hard and and you think why me and why god and why is all this stuff happening well didn't want to spend my career in pittsburgh god said we're going to bring you right home to the bay area and you're going to win some super bowls with your with your hometown team so what a huge blessing that was. It didn't really start off that way, though, because I came home and I, and I went to 49er training camp in Rockland with 130 other guys, and I was a free agent, a guy that basically was a camp body, and you had to fight and scratch and battle to even get on the field. Um, and after four weeks, I'm not even sure if the coaches knew my name. I was fighting. I was working. I was catching every pass. But there were so many other guys and so many other guys ahead of me. And I was sitting on a sideline the week before the final cuts. 
first team offenses in, and I'm I've never even sniffed close to the first team offense. So I'm down on one knee, and I'm thinking about I've got to get uh, ready to sign up for that real estate class so I can get my real estate license. Because, and this is the truth, I didn't think I was going to make it, and I ha- so now what? I'm, I wasn't going to be a football player anymore. That was plan B. That was plan B. Agent. All right. And so I don't know if I would have been any good, uh, <laughs> but I was getting ready. And while I was sitting there thinking about it, literally someone was screaming my name, Jones, Jones. And it, it, to this day, it feels like a dream. And it was Mike Holmgren, who was our offensive coordinator. He was screaming for me, the, the first unit offense on the field against the first unit defense. And I just kind of got up and was kind of out of it and went running toward the voice. And I'm running toward the huddle. And, and a couple of the tight ends had gotten hurt. And Mike Holmgren wanted me in with the first unit. And I came running in. And all of a sudden, I saw the huddle. And I started slowing down. And everybody's looking at me because I'm on the sideline running in. They're waiting for me. And I get in there. And I look and straight across from me is number 16. I'm like, whoa, Joe Montana. Wow. And I, and I kind of look next to me and Dwight Clark's looking at me. And then there's Jerry Rice and Roger Craig. And I can remember vividly having this moment like, okay, dude, you're a ball player. Act like you belong. Take a deep breath. You know, put my hands on my knees. Yeah, let's, let's call the play out, Joe. And I remember bending over. I could barely hear what he was saying. And I remember just repeating to myself, whatever you do, don't ask for any autographs. <laughs> These guys were icons. I mean, I never thought the 49ers were going to win a Super Bowl as a kid growing up in the Bay Area. And when they brought the championship in 81, I, it was, I couldn't believe it. And I was a Cowboys fan, so I was really mad. Um, <laughs> And they won it in 84. And these guys now are heroes in the Bay Area. And I'm standing in the huddle with them. Joe calls the play. And nobody, nobody, you know, everybody's, hey, double team Jerry Rice. That's not, nobody needs to cover the scrub guy that just came into the huddle. And so I was open. And Joe threw me the ball. And I made a diving catch. I was all excited. Came running back to the huddle. And, of course, he had no idea who I was. And he goes, hey, great catch, number 38. And so... <laughs> and you just think about that for a second. Number 38 is the number they give to the guy that's not going to make the team. And I challenge you all to think of any good player in any sport that's number 38. There isn't one. You go home and think about that. You, I, you're probably Googling it right now because you can't think of one. So um, I made the team by the skin of my teeth and um, – Still ups and downs, but what an amazing time. And a few years later, I was starting, um, won a Super Bowl, won a second Super Bowl. We were going to our third Super Bowl in a row. We had the Giants beat. Um, unbelievable story. We're in, and sorry, Dave, I'm getting sidetracked. But Joe Montana gets drilled. We're, we're, there's five, four minutes left in the, in the Giants game, and um, we're – we're ahead by two points. Joe Montana knocked out, broken hand out. Here, in comes Steve Young. He is a deer in the headlights. I mean, just, I, his eyes are so big in the huddle. He had no idea what he was saying, what he was doing. We, we, we lose some yards on one play. We get sacked or there's a penalty. It's third and 20. Now we're backed up. And he calls his play, 23 Texas. And, and Tom Rathman's going to run uh, a little out and in in route. Jerry Rice is going to clear. I'm running a seam down the middle. Well, we, we used to run the seam a lot, and if it was this special coverage too deep, I had a chance to get the ball down the, the middle for, you know, 25, 30, 35 yards. So we get up the line of scrimmage. Lawrence Taylor is standing right across from me. You talk about crazy eyes. Whew. I mean, he's on Dave Ramona's level, um, and it's, I was so... I was like, holy cow. And so we get up, and I see the coverage, and it's too deep. Steve Young, he has no idea what he's doing at this point. He's, he's calling the play, and I'm yelling, too deep, too deep, which is a sign to him, like, hey, dude, throw me the ball. Lawrence Taylor's yelling, hey, cover Jones. And we snap the ball. Steve drops back to pass, throws a perfect spiral down the middle. I split the seam. I caught the ball 30-something yards. We're into Giants territory, and 
I'm about to go back to my third Super Bowl in a row. And I never hardly said anything on the field, unless the guy was being a real jerk. And I dropped the ball, and I walked right by Lawrence Taylor, and this was my one shot. And I said, LT, I'm going back to the Super Bowl. <laughs> and one minute later, Lawrence Taylor recovered a fumble, and he was going to the Super Bowl. <laughs> and so that's a good lesson. Don't trash talk. And that luckily I had my helmet on, and, and he's never come and hunt me down. But I was so excited, and Steve Young was going to be our quarterback, and, and that was going to be a whole thing in and of itself. But it just shows you it's so close, and that was just the most miserable loss of my life because we had it. We had it. And we, we fumbled the ball. They recovered and kicked a field goal, and we lost. And even when things are great, there's adversity. And so... So many special times, ups and downs with the 49ers, uh, three Super Bowls. I, I was saying to the last group, I played in, in my 11 years, I played in seven NFC championship games. So I lost four, and, and I'm still sensitive about a few of those. We'll try not to give you too much of a hard time Thank about you. that. Yeah. I do love what you're saying. I mean, my mind is stuck on back when you were on injured reserve and just wondering how people look at you. I think many of us often feel like we're on injured reserve. And, uh, man, how are people looking at me? Oh, I lost my job. Or, oh, hey, our family's having a hard season. Or, oh, my kids are struggling. And we often have these same feelings. And it takes an immense amount of, of, of courage to take steps forward in those seasons. And you did that, and you do that. And that's what makes you uh, an incredible athlete. Uh, I was reminded when we were talking this week about John 16, 33 in Scripture. It says, in the world you will have tribulation. It's just like the Bible calls it out. Jesus calls it out. He says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And that's what I think one of the beautiful things about following Christ is that as things come crashing down around us, it, it's the reminder is there, this is not the end of our worlds. And you had that foundation. Brent, as an athlete, um, you were part of some of the, the best days for the Niners, but you were also part of shifting the culture. And uh, many of us in our different spheres are called to be culture shifters. What did that look like for you in one way? Well, it was interesting because now uh, I'm sure everyone out there has seen the NFL and, and where it is now. We have these choreographed celebrations. I mean, these guys must practice for a couple hours a week. Hey, it's it's Billy's celebration. Oh, no, it's Joe's celebration, and we got to do this dance. And and I think, how do they have time to even do that? But way back, and, and I added it up last night, 28 years ago, we were going to come up with what we thought, a small group of us, was going to be the most outrageous celebration ever. And we got together on a Monday night. We were playing the New York Giants the following Monday. Both teams were 10-1. and one. The two most dominant teams in the National Football League wasn't even close. These were the teams. If there could be a Super Bowl in the NFC, this would be it. So we're going to be on Monday Night Football. Tens of millions of people were going to be watching us. And we said, we're going to do something outrageous and amazing for a celebration. And it's funny because sounds good a week before. And as the days start getting close, you start going, eh, I don't know if we should do that. Or, yeah, we might get in trouble. Or, we might get fined. A couple guys said, gee, I could get cut. I mean, the coach, people could be so upset. And, it, and it's funny because a great idea on that previous Monday kind of sank to the Saturday. Like, yeah, we should probably not do that. Then on Sunday night, a few of us got together and we said, you know what? Let's do this thing. So on Monday night, we played the New York Giants. It was a heck of a battle. It was just back and forth, defensive struggle that you don't see nowadays. And so on a sloppy candlestick field, the seconds were ticking down, and, uh, and the gun went off. The Niners had won 7-3, to three, and a group of us went out to the middle of the field, and for the very first time ever, the San Francisco 49ers and a few players from the New York Giants took a knee, held hands, and prayed and said, you know what? We love this game, but there's something that's bigger in our lives that we play this game for. It was the very first prayer circle ever. And it's amazing. Thank you. It's amazing because other teams heard Called, checked in. Reggie White called my house and talked to me. He said, I mean, I was afraid of Reggie White. Reggie White is the man. Like, he's the ultimate tough guy Christian. 
And he said, we're going to pray. Brent, we're going to pray. You guys keep it up. And I was like, thank you, Mr. White. Um, and so other teams kept praying. The league tried to stop us. I had a, a five or six of us had a sheet in our, in our locker a few days later. It said, you're going to be fined $25,000 if you keep praying. NFL doesn't want that. And uh, we decided, well, let's test these guys and see. So we prayed the next week, and we had a thing in our locker a few days later. It said, the NFL is going to fine your owner a million dollars if you guys pray. And so that actually scared me a lot. And I didn't want my owner to get fined a million dollars. So we, we elected the oldest guy on our team, uh, Guy McIntyre to go talk to the owners, and, and Eddie DeBartolo said, ah, it's, don't worry about that. I love you guys. You, you, I, I think it's great what you're doing. So we kept praying. Other teams kept praying. It spread to all the NFL, spread to colleges, high schools, and now 28 years later, you, you see it all the time. And people are like, well, how did, how did teams all of a sudden start gathering together after the games and praying? And now you guys know the story. I love that. Brent, I'm just going to ask you for some final thoughts before we uh, close in a time of communion. And uh, afterwards, Brent will be hanging out at the connection point if you want to grab a photo or, or get a signature. But um, in talking on the phone, you said something that I wrote down earlier this week. You said, everything that I had been a part of was merit-based. My stats, my trophies, positions, but the gospel was something I couldn't earn. Just share with us about that. Yeah, you know what, Dave? I mean, you're based you, it, just in the NFL. Your your record is what it is. It's it's who you are. So if you've won two games, you're two two win team. If you have this many stats, you're this. And for us, um, we won, and we were winners, and we were champions, and we won Super Bowls, and we got we got rings, and you know some guys went to the Pro Bowl, and you're all pro, and you, and you did all those things, and it was all earned. But that's the beauty of the gospel. You don't earn it. You accept it. You receive it. And it's amazing to me that pro football and, and pro sports comes at you at the speed of light. Um, I mentioned before, you know, you t whether it's drugs, money, success, fame, fortune, you name it, it's all there. And the world's view of the ultimate success is to win the Super Bowl to be at the top of the mountain, to get up there and look around and go, gosh, you know, because we all try to fill our lives with, with so many exterior things. And the ring, some guys thought, hey, this ring, it's going to fill that void in my heart. Get up there, get to the top of the mountain. And after a few days or a week, you kind of get that feeling like, is that all? Is that all it is? And, and so many guys walk away empty. And, and that's, for me, I was so thankful. And, and a lot of guys in the National Football League, I think, get to the point where they're open um, to faith because they realize that there's nothing there. It's empty at the top. And I realized that back in high school. And just the fact that um, you, you understand the success and the rings and all that stuff is great, but nothing's greater than your relationship with Christ. Amen. Can we thank Brent? I love that idea that at the top, you, you get there and you realize it's just not enough. And many of us, we're, we're climbing some of the wrong ladders in our life. Or maybe you're on the right journey, but you're thinking that when I have that perfect uh, job or when I get that perfect position, right? And, and, and this is such a good reminder. It's a healthy reminder from somebody who's got to where few people get that it's not what's going to bring contentment in our lives. I love the, the most popular verse, par none, in the NFL is John 3, 16, for God so loved that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life and the contrasting taking it deeper in 1 John 3.16 it says this is how we know what love is that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and so we want to cling to that church we want to be mindful of, of, of all these incredible things God created football and it's a beautiful thing and let's have fun let's do it with excellence let's do what God calls us to with excellence but let's not miss what's most important in our lives so we're going to, uh, in a moment, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have communion. If, you're, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, we welcome you to take communion with us. Uh, we'll have two stacked cups passed. You'll just take those out. The bread represents the body of Christ, which was given for you, sacrificed for you. 
And then the, the, the juice represents the blood of Jesus shed for you. Just moments before his death on the cross, Jesus said to the disciples, do this often and remember me. And that's why as a church, we do this often and we remember what God is doing on our behalf. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for these moments of getting to dive into to Brent's story. Lord, thank you for the laughter. Thank you for the fun. Thank you for your, your faithfulness in his career, God, and his faithfulness to you. Lord, we're thankful for the, the role model that he is, not only in, 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 in accomplishing things on the field, but God, also in the home, in his marriage, in his faith, and in the community. Lord, we thank you for these moments. And for anybody in here this morning who maybe the name of Jesus is new to them, God, I pray that you would speak to them and encourage them, Lord, to take more steps, to seek out what it would look like to follow after you. So, Lord, we believe that you are inviting all of us, Lord, to this journey. We thank you for these moments. And, God, we ask that you would receive our time of communion now. In your name we pray.